This video covers basic chart scatter plot. The structure of this video is as follows Visual Code Walkthrough, JavaScript Code Build, and the Summary. All right, let's get started. Visual Code Walkthrough. We will use the TSV data from the d3js.org website scatter plot example. We will save this data into a file called data tsv. This file will be located in the folder where we will run the python simple http server command. This file is the one that will be loaded asynchronously using the d3.tsv request functionality. Let's walk through the d3.js code together. We start at the top of the document. First is the document type declaration. This tells the browser how to render the page in a standards compliant mode. This specific doc type is the correct declaration for HTML5. Next comes the meta character set. This sets the character set to UTF-8. If you are using non-minified d3.js, this is important because the d3 JavaScript file needs this particular type of encoding. The next section is the style definition of the document. This is where the CSS style of the HTML and SVG DOM elements are defined. This allows for separation of concerns. The D3 code processes the data and creates the DOM elements and the CSS styles them. This CSS defines the style for the body element. Here the CSS specifies that the font should be 10 pixels tall and should use a sans serif font. The next section defines the style for the axis path and line. The dot axis path and dot axis line are both HTML classes that have a style associated with them. Here the code is saying no fill and sets the color of the stroke to hash mark 000, which is the HTML color for black. And finally, it tells the browser that the SVG content should use the shape rendering attribute of crisp edges. The next section defines the style for a DOM element called dot. This defines the stroke of the outside of the circle that will be assigned to each data point. The stroke in this case will be black. Note that the inside color of the circle is not defined. This is because the inside color will depend on the data. So we leave the inside color definition to the D3 JavaScript code. Next, let's go into the JavaScript sections of the document. First, we load the d3.js code from the web. You can use this or a local version for personal and educational projects. If you are doing a commercial project, you should use your own version hosted on your own server or content delivery network. This ensures that you are aware of what version you are using and it doesn't change without your knowledge. Next, we go into the d3 code. This is the d3 margin convention. It specifies what margins the inner drawing space will have in order to separate it from the overall SVG container. Then the width and height for the inner drawing space are defined in terms of the margins and the overall width and height of the SVG container. The SVG container will be 500 pixels tall by 960 pixels wide. Next, we have a scale linear function for the x-axis data. This code creates a linear scaling function where the range goes from 0 to the width of the inner drawing space. So as the x-axis variable grows, it will move from the left to the right. Next, we have a scale linear function for the y-axis data. This code creates a scaling function where the range goes from the height of the inner drawing space to 0. Why backwards? Because this inverts the SVG coordinate space along the y-axis. Let me repeat that. This inverts the SVG coordinate space along the y-axis, which means that the origin point will now be at the bottom left instead of the top left. So as the y-axis variable grows, it will move up rather than down. Next, we have an ordinal scale that will be used to color the fill of the SVG circle elements. This code creates a categorical color scale function that produces 10 HTML colors. Based on the data, D3 will do the color choosing for us. Next, we create the x-axis function. We pass in the x-scale function we created earlier and give the axis an orientation of bottom. This means that the text will be below the line. How can we pass in the x-scale function before we give it a domain? The reason we can do this is because the x-scale function is a function. Until we call it, we can continue to modify the function. So the x-axis function itself now contains the x-scale function. 
Nothing is executed until the x axis function itself is called. Then we create the y axis the same way. We pass in the y scale function we created earlier and give the axis an orientation of left. This orientation will make the axis vertical and make the text appear on the left of the line. The next code creates the SVG container and the inner drawing space. First, the code selects the body and then appends an SVG container. Then, the code defines the width and height attributes of the SVG container in terms of the inner drawing space width and height and the relevant margins. Then the code appends an SVG group element, which will be the inner drawing space. This inner drawing space is transformed translated to the right and down by the relevant margins. All of this is assigned to the variable SVG, which everything else in the code will use as the reference drawing space. The next code is where the D3 code magic happens. This is where D3 does the XHR type specific call to the server to get the data.tsv file. Once the server responds with the file, the D3.tsv function calls the callback function with two arguments, the error and the data. In this case, the callback function is an anonymous function. Let's go through the callback function section by section. First, we have code that iterates through the array of JavaScript objects. For each JavaScript object, it does two things. One, it converts the sepal length from a string to a number, and two, it converts the sepal width from a string to a number. The D3 for each iteration method is used on the data array. There's an iteration method D3 provides for iterating through a JavaScript array. It applies the function specified to each element of the array. In this case, it is applying an anonymous function to each element. This function redefines the values it finds to the same keys and the same objects. This is to convert the data to a more usable type of data. Since each value of the key value pairs is a JavaScript string, this code iterates through the JavaScript objects and redefines the values from strings to numbers for the sepal length and the sepal width. The plus sign in front of the d dot sepal length converts the string to a number. This is a quick way to convert a string to a number in JavaScript. The plus sign in front of the d dot sepal width converts the string to a number. This is a quick way to convert a string to a number in JavaScript. Next, we set the domain for the x scale function. Now that we have the data, we can set the domain for the x scale function by using the d3 extent method. The d3 extent function returns an array containing the minimum and maximum sepal widths. This array then gets passed to the domain. Then using the chaining syntax, we will call the dot nice function. The dot nice open parentheses, close parentheses function is something new that has not been covered before. Dot nice extends the domain so that it starts and ends on nice round values. This method typically modifies the scales domain and may only extend the bounds to the nearest round value. When using the dot nice functionality, it's often called nicing. Nicing is particularly useful if the domain is computed from data, which may be irregular. Next, we set the domain for the Y scale function. Now that we have the data, we can set the domain of the Y scale function by using the D3 extent method. The D3 extent function returns an array containing the minimum and maximum sepal lengths. This array then gets passed to the domain. Then using the chaining syntax, we will call the dot nice function. Next, we call D3 axis operator for the X axis. First, the code appends an SVG group element to hold the X axis. Then the group element is given the class of X axis. Then it is transform translated by the height of the inner drawing space. This transform translate moves the G element containing the X axis elements to the bottom of the inner drawing space. Then the X axis function is called. This works correctly because we have now defined the x scaling function domain and range. Finally, we append text to the x axis, which will be used as an axis label. The SVG text element is given a DOM element class attribute. Then the x and y attributes are defined. The style is defined as a text anchor and placed at the end of the x axis. And lastly, the text for the SVG text is defined. Overall, this places a small label on the x axis. Next, we call D3 axis operator for the Y axis. 
First, the code appends an SVG group element to hold the Y axis. Then the group element is given the class of Y axis. Then that Y axis function is called. This works correctly because we have now defined the Y scaling function domain and range. Finally, we append text to the Y axis, which will be used as an axis label. The SVG text element is given a DOM element class attribute. This text is transformed by rotating it negative 90 degrees. Then the Y and DY attributes are defined. The style is defined as a text anchor and placed at the end of the Y axis. And lastly, the text of the SVG text is defined. Overall, this places a small label on the Y axis. Next, we draw the dots that represent the data in the graph. This is the D3 pattern. We select all a class of DOM elements which do not yet exist. We bind data to those elements. We choose the enter selection. We append and merge the SVG circle elements with the placeholder elements created by the data functionality. Then we add specific attributes to the SVG circle elements to create them specifically from the data. The DOM element class is defined as dot for all the circles. The radius is defined as 3.5 for all the circles. The CX attribute is defined as the sepal width. The CY attribute is defined as the sepal length. And the fill color is defined using the ordinal categorical color scale category 10. This makes it so that every data point in the data will have its own specific CX, CY, and fill color. A very important thing happens when we assign the fill color that is worth paying very close attention to. This code does two things at once. In addition to having the category scale choose a color for us, this also adds the species name to the domain of the category function if it doesn't already exist. Let me say that again. In addition to having the category scale choose a color for us, this also adds the species name to the domain of the category function if it doesn't already exist. Which means that if we pass in a species name to the color ordinal scale, it will always return the same color. It also means that after all the circles have been created, the domain of the color ordinal scale will have a list of all the species that were created. This is very useful as you'll see shortly. Lastly, we create a legend for the scatter plot chart. This is done in three separate sections of code. The first section creates a legend for each of the species types. The second section creates a rectangle that contains the color of that species for each of the species types. The third section creates the text of the species name for each of the species types. Let's walk through each section. The first section creates an SVG group element with a class of legend for each species type. This follows the D3 pattern. We select all a class of DOM elements which do not yet exist. We bind the data to these elements. The data here is the domain of the color ordinal scale. This is where it was very useful that the color fill of the circles not only chose a color, but also added each species type to the domain of the color ordinal scale. We choose the enter selection. We append and merge the SVG group elements with the placeholder elements created by the data functionality. Then we add specific attributes to the SVG group elements to create them specifically from the data. The DOM element class is defined as legend for all of the SVG group elements created by the data. Then each legend is transformed translated to a specific part of the graph based on the index. This is so that the legends will all be on top of one another in the same part of the chart. The second section creates a rectangle that contains the color of that species for each of the species types. This code takes the selection of all the legends created in the previous code section and appends SVG rectangles. The rectangle's width and height attributes are set to hard-coded values. The rectangle's X attribute is set so that it is 18 pixels off of the right edge of the chart. This is done by subtracting 18 from the width variable, which is the width of the inner drawing space. Lastly, the fill of each color is defined by the color ordinal scale. One thing to notice here is that the passing of the data object is not explicit. D3 implicitly understands that it should use the data bound to the specific legend. Thus, it is able to use the data passed into the style call for the legend without having it be specified. The third section creates the text of the species name for each of the species types. This code takes the selection of all the legends created in the first code section and appends SVG text. 
the SVG text's Y and DY attributes are set to hard-coded values. The SVG text's X attribute is set so that it's 24 pixels off of the right edge of the chart. This is done by subtracting 24 from the width variable, which is the width of the inner drawing space. Lastly, the actual text of the SVG text element is defined by the anonymous function, which returns the data attached to each SVG group element with the class of legend. The function is defined explicitly to make sure the right data is assigned. And that is the end of the callback function and the end of the d3.tsv function. When this is done, the graph will have been fully generated. Let's now build this part by part in JavaScript. JavaScript code build. Because the building of the chart happens inside of the callback function, we will use a more simple anonymous callback function. We do this in this way for two reasons. One, it's easier to do on the JavaScript console as we build the chart piece by piece. And two, it reinforces the idea of the callback function and how it works. Though to be honest, the preferred way of coding it when you code it into your web page is the way it's done in the example. That way it's clear that it is a callback function and it is all in one place. All right, to the JavaScript console. We start by saving the example data into the data.tsv file. This file lives in the folder where we will start the Python simple HTTP server. Next, we start the Python simple HTTP server from the command line. Now we have the server going and have the data file ready to be served up. Next, we make sure the index.html file is saved in the right place and has D3 being loaded into it. We can see the web page. We open the Chrome developer tools and test to make sure D3 loaded correctly, then clear the screen. D3 loaded correctly, now we clear the screen. Next, we go step by step building the visualization. We start by defining the callback error and callback data variables, which will be used to house the data we get back from the d3.tsv function. The first step from the example is defining the margins and the width and height of the inner drawing space. Next, define the x scaling function as well as the range of the function. Next, define the y scaling function as well as the range of the function. Remember to pay attention to the fact that the range has height first and then zero, which inverts the y-axis. Next, define the x-axis function and provide it with a scale and orientation. Next, define the y-axis function and provide it with a scale and orientation as well. Next, define the SVG container and the inner drawing space. This is the first sign of anything occurring in the browser. Up to now, we have just been defining functions that will use or be used by the data that is passed in. This code is where we are going to differ from the example code. Instead of defining an anonymous callback function that does all the generating of the chart in one go, we will define a callback function that assigns the data and error to variables. We'll then use these variables to build the line chart. Let's check what the d3.tsv call assigned to the callback error variable. The callback error is null, which means the d3.tsv call worked correctly. Let's check what the d3.tsv call assigned to the callback data variable. The callback data is an array of 150 elements, which means the d3.tsv call worked correctly. Let's take a look at the first element of this array. You can see that it is a JavaScript object that has the key value pairs for sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and species. Each value is currently a string. Next, we use the d3array for each iterator to go through the array and change the string values to numbers. Let's take a look now at the first element of this array. You can see that the values for sepal length and sepal width are no longer strings, they are now numbers. To check to make sure the sepal length is now a JavaScript number, we can use the type of JavaScript function, which tells us it is a number. To make sure the sepal width is now a JavaScript number, we can use the type of JavaScript function, which tells us it is a number. Satisfied that both sepal length and sepal width are both numbers, let's move on. Next, define the domain of the x scale function. Let's check to see what the extent was for the x scale. We can see that the lowest sepal width is 2 and the highest sepal width is 4.4. Let's also check to see what the domain of the xscale function is. 
you can see that the domain is the same as what the extend function provided. This means that the nicing provided by the nice function did not alter the domain. Next, define the domain for the y scale function. Let's check to see what the extent was for the y scale. We can see that the lowest supple length is 4.3 and the highest supple length is 7.9. Let's also check to see what the domain of the y scale function is. You can see that the domain is not the same as what the extent function provided. This means that the nicing provided by the nice function didn't alter the domain. It made the ends nicer. Instead of the lowest value being 4.3, it is now 4.0. Instead of the highest value being 7.9, it is now 8.0. This is what the nice function can do for us. Next, define the categorical color ordinal scale. Next, the x-axis is created. Note again that the transform translate moves the x-axis group element to the bottom of the inner drawing space. On my screen, you can see the start of the x-axis as Chrome developer tools are taking up about two-thirds of the web page. That said, you can see the number 2.0 to the number 2.8. If we click into the SVG group element for the inner drawing space, you can see the SVG group element with the class x-axis. This is the x-axis. Next, the y-axis is created. You can see the y-axis and the text anchor declaring that it is the supple length in centimeters. If we click into the SVG group element for the inner drawing space, you can see the SVG group element with the class y-axis. This is the y-axis. Now we create the dots according to the data. And there you have it. You can see the data represented as dots. Because we are not applying any CSS to style the dots, let's do the stroke line of the circles in D3. This is done in CSS in the example. Lastly, let's create the legend to the graph in three parts. First, we create the three SVG group elements with the class of legend. Though the Chrome developer tools are currently covering up the legend, we can see the DOM elements are there. Second, we create the rectangles filled with color inside of the three legends. Here you can see the SVG rectangle and the attributes that were defined for it. Lastly, we create the text that goes along with the legends. Here you can see the SVG text element as well as the text inside of the element. And there we go. We have the finished scatter plot chart. Let's close the Chrome developer tools to get a better look. You can see the full picture. The only difference between this and the example was the styling applied to the various DOM elements. And with that, we have built the basic chart scatter plot. We used data served from a web server and processed it through an asynchronous XHR call provided by the d3.tsv type specific method. The summary. This video provided a visual code walkthrough, a JavaScript code build, and the summary.